I uh, welcome everyone to the orthopedics session of ASB 2021. We'll go ahead and um, get started real quick. Um, I'm Josh Roth. I'm an assistant professor at UW Madison, and I'll be one of the moderators. Sarah and Hoon, do you want to introduce yourselves too? Yep, uh, I'm a co-moderator. My name is Hoon Kim. I'm in um, Applied Biomechanics Laboratory at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I'm a first year postdoc here. I'm Sarah Masaga. I'm a PhD candidate uh, at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in Professor Mariana Kirsch's uh, Tissue Biomechanics Lab. Thanks. So the, the structure of this session will be divided into three blocks and each block will have four five minute long talks with 10 minutes at the end of each of those blocks for questions. Um, at any time you can enter questions into the chat and the one of the one of the moderators will be will be monitoring those. At the end during the 10 minute question section, if you prefer to um, say your question out loud. You're welcome to raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can uh, ask your question to the, to the presenter directly. If we hopefully we have so many questions that we run out of time during our 10 minute talks during our 10 minute parts, um, but we will have uh, a spatial chat after this that will allow you to either follow up on questions that you had or ask questions that we weren't able to get to. And a link to that spatial chat will be uh, put in by our host, Sophia, right uh, towards the end of the session. All right, great. Um, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, our first talk is going to be given by Katerina Red, uh, Radomovich, um, Mechanical Property Changes of Pediatric Cortical Bone Due to Saline Storage Time. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to begin sharing my screen uh, in just a moment. Just a minute here, sorry, there is a slight lag. Okay. Um, can you see my screen or is it uh, is the view at all obstructed by this top? Nope, we can see it fine. Bar? Okay, okay, great. Um, let me just move my cursor here. Thank you again for the introduction and good morning, everyone. I would like to thank ASB for the opportunity to present my work today. I would also like to thank my collaborators at Marquette University and the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and at Shriners Hospital for Children in Chicago. In orthopedic research, bone specimens are often submerged in buffered saline solution while awaiting mechanical testing. Zhang et al. observed changes in material properties of bovine cortical bone tissue collected after three-day saline preservation at room temperature. However, the effects of saline storage time on the material properties of human healthy pediatric cortical diaphyseal bone have not been reported. The purpose of this study was to investigate macroscopic material properties of healthy pediatric cortical bone under refrigerated saline storage conditions over time. One cortical bone specimen was collected from the femur of a 10-year-old female with no known musculoskeletal condition. 24 miniature rectangular beams were machined from the specimen using a diamond saw, with the long beam axis being parallel to the long diaphyseal axis. Following machining, the beams were immediately submerged in buffered saline solution and stored in a refrigerator at 4 degrees Celsius. A custom three-point bending jig was mounted atop an electromechanical materials test machine. Then a subset of three to four beams was loaded to failure in three-point bending daily for a duration of up to one week. Stress and strain were computed from the load and LVDT displacement data. And from the stress strain data, material properties, including elastic modulus, yield strength, yield strain, and bending strength were identified. Multiple linear regression analyses were used to explore associations between each macroscopic property being the dependent variable and saline storage time being the independent variable. These analyses assumed a slope of zero until a selected cutoff day with cutoffs at days one through six having been assessed, after which a negative linear slope was fit to the data. 
The variable x sub i is zero prior to a selected cutoff value and equal to the day number minus the cutoff day after that. This multiple linear regression model with a cutoff is shown. The cutoff with the lowest corrected Akaike information criterion or AICC was used in the regression model for each material property. The AICC was used to evaluate the quality of each model. The best cutoff day for all material properties occurred at day four. However, the expected reduction in all the material properties investigated was less than the mechanical testing range of 12% through five days of saline storage. The 12% mechanical testing range was determined based on range in elastic modulus with repeated testing of a single acrylic beam and accounts for user error in beam positioning and potential instrumentation error. Therefore, testing of pediatric cortical bone on six days and after expects a reduction in strength exceeding the mechanical testing range of 12%. Specifically, yield strength and bending strength each, dec each decreased by 13% on day six. Shown is the bending strength versus saline storage time for healthy pediatric cortical bone beams. The corresponding multiple linear regression model with a cutoff, the cutoff being represented by a dashed line at day four for the data set is also shown, the model being the solid line. At day six, the model demonstrates a 13% decrease in bending strength from its initial intercept of 211 megapascals. The sample storage logistics surrounding material property characterization should be taken into consideration during experimental design of biomechanical testing. The current conclusions differ from those of Zhang et al. However, the current study differed from Zhang's in species being human and storage temperature having used refrigeration. Degradation of the macroscopic outcomes was within the, was within the testing range through day five of refrigerated saline storage. This exploratory finding could be confirmed through a larger planned experimental study. These findings indicate that material properties of pediatric cortical bone do not substantially degrade within a five-day period following sample preparation. Thank you very much. I will take any questions at the end of this block. Thank you, Katerina. Our next talk is coming from uh, Suyata Kondair. Uh, focused ultrasound could be an alternative to dry needling for treatment of tendon injuries. Yep, that looks good. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. So musculoskeletal injuries affect millions of Americans and account for enormous associated costs. And tendon injuries comprise of approximately 30% of the total musculoskeletal injuries each year. Tendon injuries can range from inflammation of the tissue to micro tears or disorganized collagen fibers, making the tendon mechanically weaker and increasing the risk for rupture. As tendons transmit large forces from muscle to bone, for example, 1.4 times the body weight at the shoulder joint or 13 times body weight at the Achilles tendon, it is important that the mechanical effects of treatments must be considered to ensure that treatments do not negatively affect tendon mechanical properties while improving tendon healing. Dry needling is one of the widely used conservative therapies for treating tendon injuries. Dry needling involves peppering the tendon with a thin filiform needle to alleviate pain and restore function. However, it is invasive and the high interpractitioner variability has led to mixed success rates. Repeated needle insertions at the tendon might disrupt the collagen fibers, thereby weakening the tendon and increasing the risk for tendon failure. Moreover, limited, limited studies exploring the mechanical effects of dry needling exposes a gap in our understanding of this treatment's implications. On the other hand, focused ultrasound is an emerging ultrasound therapy that can change the way we treat tendon injuries. Focused ultrasound directs the ultrasound energy into a well-defined focal volume of the tissue. Focus ultrasound has the potential to non-invasively introduce micro damage, while micro damage in tendon similar to dry needling, which could be beneficial in tendon healing while still maintaining the tendon mechanical properties. The choice of ultrasound parameters directs the bioeffects towards either thermal ablation or mechanical fractionation, which is thought to produce the desired healing effects. 
However, it remains unclear how focused ultrasound affects tendon mechanical properties, nor is it clear what set of acoustic parameters will introduce mechanical fractionation. Therefore, the objective of this study is to evaluate the effect of dry needling and three different focused ultrasound parameter sets chosen to emphasize mechanical fractionation on the elastic properties of Achilles and supraspinatus tendons. So in order to achieve our objective, we divided 50 Achilles and 50 supraspinatus tendons from Spragdowli rats into five groups, that is sham, dry needling, focused ultrasound one, two, and three, with 10 tendons per group. Tendons were exposed to dry needling or three different parameter sets of focused ultrasound. These parameters were chosen based on previous studies in other tissues to emphasize mechanical fractionation over thermal ablation. After treatment intervention, the tendons were mechanically tested using an established testing protocol involving cyclic loading, stress relaxation, and load to failure tests. Tendon elastic properties, including elastic modulus and stiffness, were determined from the stress strain curve and the load displacement curve, respectively. Group differences in elastic parameters were, assisted with, were assessed with two way and COVA, with sex as covariate and significant set at 0.05. 100 samples were successfully tested and six measures were removed as outliers. The elastic modulus of Achilles tendons in sham and focus ultrasound one group was higher than dry needling. Whereas in the case of supraspinatus tendons, the modulus of sham was higher than dry needling, focus ultrasound two and focus ultrasound three. And the modulus of focus ultrasound one was higher than dry needling. The stiffness of Achilles tendons in sham was higher than dry needling, focus ultrasound one, two, and three. Whereas the stiffness of supraspinatus tendons in sham was higher than dry needling, and the stiffness, was, stiffness of focus ultrasound one was higher than dry needling and focus ultrasound two. For elastic modulus, there was no significant interaction between the treatments and tendons, but main effect of treatment and tendon were observed. For stiffness, the significant interaction between treatments and tendons and main effect of treatments was, was observed. These results suggest that dry needling causes a decline in elastic properties of both Achilles and supraspinatus tendons. Focus ultrasound preserved elastic modulus better than dry needling with the focus ultrasound one parameter set performing better than two and three. The observed differences in mechanical properties of Achilles and supraspinatus tendons may be driven by the different roles these tendons play in VO and suggest that treatments may need to be tailored to specific tendons. Ongoing work involves investigating the in vivo mechanical and healing effects of dry needling and focus ultrasound. Understanding the effects of focus ultrasound will help evaluate focus ultrasound for clinical translation as an alternative non-invasive treatment for tendon injuries. With this, I'd like to thank the funding sources, my PI, and everyone else involved in the project. And I'm happy to take any questions in the chat or towards the end, or even in the spatial chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next, and just a reminder, people can post chat. You can post questions in the chat at any time. Um, so our third talk will be by Rudy Salbego, uh, using shear wave tensiometry in mechanical phantoms with partial width defects. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Thank you for the introduction. I'd also like to thank my co-authors, Leslie Arendt, Daryl Stalin, and Stephanie Cohn. So every year in the United States, there are over 30 million injuries involving tendons and ligaments, and many of these involve partial tears, where the decreased cross-sectional area of the remaining tendon leads to higher stress concentrations. However, these mechanical changes are difficult to measure in vivo, safely isolating just the tendon to get accurate measurements. So in our lab, we've recently developed shear wave tensiometry as a way to non-invasively measure tendon shear wave speeds. In tensiometry, a shear wave is excited in the tendon, and then the wave speed is determined by using the delay in wave arrival time between two laser measurement points and the distance between the lasers. These shear wave speeds have been found to modulate proportionally to the square root of axial stress. And while tensiometry has been validated in healthy tendons, 
it has not yet been applied to injured tendons. So prior to applying this technique to injured tendons, we decided to create fibrous constructs or mechanical phantoms that emulate tendon behavior to mimic expected changes following partial tears. The objective of this work was to study the effects of partial width defects on the wave speed stress relationship in mechanical phantoms. The phantoms were created in a custom mold using yarn and a commercial silicone product that resulted in high axial stiffness, but low shear stiffness, similar to tendons. And three defect sizes were created, intact phantoms, small defects, and large defects. The tapper used to induce, to induce the wave was placed at the bottom of the phantom and laser measurement points and defect locations are shown in orange on the phantoms. The phantoms were placed in a unit axial tensile, test, tensile testing machine and a ramp load was applied increasing from zero to 150 newtons at 20 newtons per second. The mechanical tapper was driven by a 10 hertz square wave to excite shear waves in the phantom and wave speeds were measured as described previously using lasers. To analyze the data, we created linear regressions between tensile load and wave speed squared for each trial and an ANOVA to determine how defect size affected peak wave speeds. The wave speed measurements collected on the defect size of the phantoms are not shown because the shear wave couldn't propagate past the defect as expected, resulting in poor correlations. However, this is data from one representative phantom looking at wave speed squared measurements on the intact side across ramp loading. As you can see, there were strong linear relationships between axial tension and shear wave speed squared across all defect sizes. And in addition, as the defect size increased, the slope of the lines increased by 106%, indicating larger wave speed measurements for phantoms with larger defects. When looking at all phantoms in all trials, there was a 65% increase in peak, where, peak squared wave speed in large defect phantoms compared to intact phantoms. However, between the intact phantoms and those with small defects, the increase in peak squared wave speed was not significant, leading us to believe that wave speed differences are dependent on the defect size. In conclusion, we are able to support two ideas that this, the wave speed squared stress relationship held in these defected phantoms, and also that phantoms with defects exhibited higher shear wave speeds than those that were intact. This link between stress concentrations and shear wave speeds in phantoms could be used eventually in clinical or rehabilitation settings. For example, we could assess an athlete's shear wave speed in an injured tendon to tell us, to, to, to tell us if they are ready to return to normal activity. In the future, we're hoping to extend this study by looking at defects of different sizes and in varied locations, and more specifically at different ex vivo tendon injuries. I would like to thank and acknowledge the UW Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab, the Roth Group Biomechanical Advances in Medicine Lab, and NIH funding. Thank you. Thanks, Ruby. All right, the last talk of this first block is by Stephanie Cohn, Achilles Tendon Shear Wave Speeds Exhibit Guided Wave Dispersion During Walking. All right. Thank you for the introduction, and I would like to thank my co-authors for their contributions to this work. So to jump into things, current biomechanical approaches for estimating both muscle and tendon force and loading during walking, running, other activities are limited by the fact that they're typically very indirect. So generally, our approaches require models so that we can make assumptions and fill in gaps either in the swing phase or when it comes to separating out parameters for these biomechanical studies by individual tissues instead of looking at total joints or ground reaction forces. However, shear wave tensiometry, which Ruby was just discussing, um, can target superficial tendon mechanics more directly and fill in some of those gaps, such as the swing phase or when we're trying to look at just the Achilles tendon or just other superficial tissues. So in shear wave tensiometry, we have a mechanical tapper here shown as this gray uh, box which initiates a mechanical tap, creates a shear wave that travels through the tendon, passes two accelerometers, and then we're able to look at the accelerometer traces represented by these gray and green lines, look at the difference in wave arrival times, and then study the wave speed from there. This allows us to plot the shear wave speed that's going directly through the tendon, 
across the entirety of a gate cycle in this instance, gathering data both for the stance and swing phases. Um, to date, this has been done with impulsive taps, so just taking a single square wave either at a full 50% duty cycle or shorter. However, what we're interested in is seeing if we can excite different frequencies instead of being limited to those generated by our impulsive taps. And so to do that in this study, our parameter of interest was the frequency of the excitation wavelet, so generating Gaussian wavelets in shapes similar to those shown on the right at different frequencies ranging from 250 to 1450 hertz. And to do this, we have our mechanical tapper shown in the diagrams on the left, where we're able to either extend or retract the teal tapping head um, using a piezoelectric actuator. And we just do that in certain patterns to generate the target frequencies. So overall, the objective of our work this time around was to explore how the frequency content of these excitation wavelets would affect the measured wave speeds during walking in the Achilles tendon. And we suspected that guided wave dispersion could arise due to the guided wave effects within the tendon tissue, viscoelastic properties of the tendon itself, and the influence of adjacent layered structures, such as the muscle underneath or the superficial tissue, uh, skin, et cetera. So to investigate this, we had 16 subjects, eight female, eight male, and these subjects were walking barefoot on a treadmill for about 10 minutes total as part of a larger collection. Um, I mentioned that we look at impulsive taps as well, but for this data, we were collecting 10 second sensiometry collections uh, with seven different conditions, randomized and collected in triplicate. So basically we just had them all go at once and then collected a randomized stream of data to compare. And when we're looking at a single subject worth of data, this is what came out of that longer collection. So in this plot, each strand is an individual stride and then each color band would be representing a different excitation wavelet frequency. So going from the darkest frequencies are the 250 Hertz all the way to the 450 uh, higher frequency wavelet data. And looking at this one representative subject, what we're seeing is that there is a large change in the maximum shear wave speed measured in the Achilles tendon during that push off phase of walking. So around that 50% to 60% time frame. And what we were able to see with that is that there is a major effect on your measured peak wave speed, which we would then be correlating to a peak tendon force. Looking at this population average again of shear wave speed on the y axis. What we were able to see is that across our 16 subjects, we held the same pattern of having a major effect on those push off wave speeds, where we had large increases looking at the shortest or the slowest frequencies, uh, the 250 hertz. We were also able to see that in the lower regions, so in the more slack tendon ranges of the gait cycle, you actually had an increase with the higher frequencies. So what it looks like is that we have just a greater dynamic range where the low wave speeds are low and the high wave speeds are higher when we're looking at those 250 and other lower frequency wavelets. Overall, this led us to see the excited frequency of the input signal has a variable effect or is generating that different dynamic range of wave speeds across the gate cycle. The dispersive effects that we're seeing may be tied to some guided wave behavior in the Achilles tendon itself. And we suspect, uh, based on prior literature, as well as some of our imaging studies, that this is due to layered tissues and viscoelastic properties. And future work, we're going to look at the intersection between this and our impulsive excitation testing. So with that, I'd like to thank the lab and our funding sources. And I'd be happy to take questions, I believe, now that we're at the end of the block. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, so these, these first four talks are open for discussion. Okay, uh, now we have a Q&A session and we have uh, one question from the chat window. And the first question is for Sujata from Heath Henninger. And the question is, Sujata, very nice study and an interesting question to examine. Is the pre, uh, pre preservation of tissue modulus a good or bad thing for the patient? Isn't, isn't the goal of these treatments to alleviate tension or stiffness is the affected tissue? Hey, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I, um, so 
the goal of these uh, treatments, especially like uh, dry needling and focus ultrasound, was to preserve the mechanical integrity of the tendon. So, so maintaining the elastic modulus is a good thing, and uh, and that 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 is what we're trying to do while maintaining, uh, oh sorry, while uh, facilitating tendon healing. So yeah, so preserving tendon modulus, tissue modulus is a is a good thing. Thank you, Sujata. Um, I have a question to Katarina. Um, so how much do you think that these results vary uh, subject to subject and bone to bone? Uh, that's a really good question. So yes, I as I mentioned in my um, talk just before, um, I was only looking at um, one specimen from one donor. So uh, potentially if this study was to be expanded, um, one would want to look at more donors and more specimens. Um, there is just interspecimen variability that you may have seen within the the day to day spread of the bending strength that you saw on the graph. But um, I can't tell you for certain the, the exact number of donors and specimens that need to be investigated without doing a power study or preliminary test to determine that. But uh, yes, this is very a very preliminary data set. So. I would want to look at at least two different donors and multiple specimens from each donor, and then also uh, expand the, the saline storage period as well. It's a very vague answer from me, but um, yeah, you wouldn't want to look at just one donor, but this is just for a, a preliminary data set. So thank you for the, the question. Thank you, Katarina. Um, I also have a question for Stefani. Um, could you tell us about the possibility of applying the device to other soft tissues or other tendons? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll say my primary interests are actually driving it up towards the knee. So looking at patellar tendon, quad tendon, hamstrings, IT band, um, I'll say that you do need some pretty superficial tissue access. So at the moment, that's kind of the limitation of we need to be able to get onto that layer of tendon. Um, but I know that Josh uh, also here is interested in driving this towards the operating room. So we're definitely looking at a lot of those options. It's just a matter of figuring out how to control for any layered tissue effects that we're seeing and get good access where we can kind of cleanly collect and excite those shear waves. Thank you for the answers. Mm -hmm. um, the next question uh, is from our moderator to um, Ruby. Um, have you oh. tried? I can ask it, Hoon. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I actually yeah. want to change the question. Um, Ruby, have you like thought about making these uh, phantoms with different cross sections, like more circular or oval, something that would be closer to like an ACL or PCL? Um, and do you think like the behavior of the defect in your phantoms would change with a different cross section? So I'm actually going to take Ruby's question. She lost internet right between her talk and the question section, but I'm happy to address that for you. Um, and we've definitely thought about it. So right now we're trying to keep everything controlled and actually look at the fiber orientation and the fiber patterns within the tissue. So again, looking at different levels of orientation and uh, whether they're very parallel or a little bit more disorganized, but that's certainly kind of a next step. It's easier to stick to the rectangles for now. So we're not looking at circular at the moment, but that would definitely be a cool future direction. Have you um, made the phantoms with like different yarn types? So like acrylic versus wool or how many substrands are in the yarn or the twist angle? Cause I think, sure, I'm not sure so, if that would affect the overall pattern of behavior. So we've actually been sticking to a paper I believe that came out of y'all's lab um, representing kind of a suggested silicone and uh, yarn combination. Um, for the moment, we're sticking with that, but we are looking at uh, going to fewer strands within a yarn um, in order to just be able to pack more at a more disorganized level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for great presentations in the first block. And now we can jump into the second block of the presentations. So the next presenter is um, Andrew Behrens. The presentation is three-dimensional coverage maps in the assessment of short part uh, subluxation in progressive 
collapsing foot deformity. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors for their assistance with this study. Um, a progressive collapsing foot deformity, commonly referred to as flat foot, is characterized by the collapse of the longitudinal arch of the foot. Recent evidence has identified it as a more complex multi-component deformity. Previous research has focused on two-dimensional analysis of midfoot changes. This is the first study to analyze and quantify these changes in three dimensions. Recent studies have identified subluxation of the hind foot as a critical component of PCFD. In this case, subluxation is the partial dislocation of the joint between the calcaneus and calus. While changes in the hind foot, shown in red, have become better understood, changes in the midfoot, shown in blue, have yet to be well characterized. For this study, we sought to evaluate the Chapart joint between the hind foot and midfoot, and we hypothesized that subluxation of the midfoot could be characterized in the Chapart joint. To test our hypothesis, we evaluated 19 patients with PCFD and 20 control patients. These patients were selected for having weight-bearing CT imagery available, no prior surgeries or deformities. Weight-bearing CT loads joints in the functional standing position where subluxation may occur. Geometries were extracted from weight-bearing CT data using DZUR Bone Logic 2.0, an automated segmentation and analysis service. Candidate contact area, shown in pink, was selected on the STLs using Geomagic Design X. Coverage and distance maps were created in MATLAB by projecting the surface normals from opposing STL meshes created from the candidate contact area selections. Uncoverage of the joint provides an objective means of detecting subluxation. To evaluate where subluxation may be occurring, we divided the Taylor head and the calcaneocuboid facet into six and four segments, respectively. These segments were defined using principal component analysis. We computed the coverage percent by dividing the area of the surface that had a joint space width of less than five millimeters by the total area of the surface. Here we can see a control case on the left and a PCFD case on the right. In general, you can see there is more coverage in the control case and that it is more evenly distributed. The right side of all these images is the medial side the bottom is inferior. Coverage is clearly decreased in the medial regions for patients with PCFD when compared to controls. Now, looking for these trends across the cases we studied, you can see that the control cases, again, have more coverage medially and inferiorly when compared to PCFD cases. Quantifying these results, medial coverage decreased by nearly 50% in the Taylor head Shown here in red, the coverage increased by 14% laterally. A similar change occurred on the calcaneus with a 19% decrease in coverage inferiorly and an increase in coverage superiorly and laterally. These values for percent change are relative to the controls. Values with an asterisk are significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.05. In summary, we developed tools to quantify 3D measures of subluxation in the Chopart joint for the first time. Our results support the occurrence of significant Chopart joint changes in early flexible PCFD. These changes are consistent with midfoot subluxation, which has long been thought to be part of flat foot deformity. Therefore, when combined with prior results from the hind foot, we can now quantify components, hind foot and midfoot subluxation. These could be used to delineate subtypes of deformity in future studies. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them during the Q&A session or via email. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for presenting the great study. Uh, the next speaker is Amy Lenz. The presentation is Total Anchor Replacement in Vivo Kinematics, a biplane fluoroscopy uh, imaging study. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors at the University of Utah. The background and motivation here is that 100,000 individuals suffer from ankle osteoarthritis each year, and total ankle replacement, or TAR, is a treatment option for end-stage ankle away, as seen in the radiograph on the right. This implant shown here is a Zimmer trabecular metal implant, which is a different anatomy and approach than the typical total ankle replacement designs to date. 
However, total ankle replacements have not yet had a common morphometric based design because of their still high risk failures and 10 year follow up uh, failure rates. And we don't understand that quite yet because the joint itself has not been able to be isolated and investigated uh, for its function in vivo. So abnormal kinematics may lead to reduced function or also secondary risk of subtalar osteoarthritis at the adjacent joint below. So our objective here was to answer the question, does this particular Zimmer total ankle replacement demonstrate prosthetic ankle joint and adjacent joint kinematic compensations? And we performed this analysis by recruiting six patients with unilateral total ankle replacement and also six controls to act as a comparative group. Our participants did experimental data in our uh, motion capture lab, which is synced to a biplane fluoroscopy system as seen here. This patient is performing a walking trial where we see our two calibrated biplane fluoroscopy views where it's synchronized in approximately a 90 to 100 degree relationship. But in order to make sense of this data, we also take a CT image stack, create bone segmentations, then digitally reconstructed radiographs, and use these green digitally reconstructed radiographs in each frame to markerless track the bone's position throughout time. And this yields in the lower right-hand corner our kinematics from this evaluation, where we can not only look at the implant's function, but also the adjacent subtalar kinematics. This data is then normalized from percent stance defined by heel strike to toe off so that we can compare across all participants how their kinematic function is occurring within an activity. So to jump right into the results, first we're looking at tibio angles for our overground walking activity. Our first column is a within participant, TR participant comparison, where we're looking at the total ankle replacement limb compared to their contralateral untreated limb. And we see that there are no significant differences between all three planes in dorsiplanar flexion, inversion, eversion, and internal and external rotation. Second column is our total ankle replacement limb compared to the healthy individuals as our control group. And we do see an increased dorsiflexion in late stance in our, total, our controls that we do not observe in our total ankle replacement patients, which does yield a significant decrease in range of motion for our total ankle replacement patients. However, the frontal and transverse plane kinematics remain unchanged with no statistically significant differences. Also to note, we wanted to evaluate the untreated limb of our total ankle replacement patients with comparison to controls in the third column in order to understand if there were any kinematic compensations occurring on the opposite limb due to the total ankle replacement. However, again, we did not see any significant changes in this comparison, yielding no compensations occurring on the contralateral limb. So overall, the total ankle replacement was performing quite well with minimal reduced dorsiflexion changes and late stance of walking. But now looking at our subtalar angles for overground walking, we find a very fascinating result of minimal again compensations compared to in the first column, their untreated limb. In the second column, the healthy controls where only minimal compensations at the subtalar joint are observed in late stance for dorsiplanar flexion and inversion eversion. And lastly, minimal inversion eversion changes of the contralateral limb when compared to the uh, untreated controls. So overall, we have some very positive clinical outcomes for our kinematics. And we believe this is because modern total ankle replacement designs typically include a bicondylar geometric shape to mimic the shape of the native tibiotalar joint. And because our patients we showed have with this Zimmer TAR performed activities symmetrically with no kinematic uh, differences, this indicates that they're functioning quite well and would rate highly on our clinical parameters for evaluating post-operative outcomes. When it comes to comparing our data to other data within the literature, this is the first biplane fluoroscopy study to actually isolate a total ankle replacement kinematic function without the combined kinematic influence of the subtalar joint. However, when we look at the combined contribution of the tibiotalar and subtalar joints, 
our results are comparable to Brodsky, Brewing, and Fritz et al., which looked at similar total range of motion being performed by the uh, unilateral total ankle replacements. However, these were in other types of implants, such as the star or celto implants, which means that even different TAR designs are maybe functioning uh, more similarly. Also, the uh, symmetric gait is a positive clinical outcome because asymmetric gait has been shown to require up to 80% more metabolic energy. And with our symmetric results, this indicates that our patients are likely not burdened by an increased metabolic load. Lastly, the normal kinematics at the subtalar joint are a very positive clinical outcome, which may explain the lower risk of developing subtalar secondary OA in these patients with total ankle replacement. So overall, our take home message is that total ankle replacement provides near normal postoperative motion with symmetrical kinematics, yielding positive clinical outcomes. I'd like to acknowledge my team and the other uh, PIs in the Orthopedic Research Lab, because this is truly a collaborative team and our funding sources. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Amy. Uh, the next presenter is Songning Chang. The presentation is Compartmental Knee Contact Forces in Patients with Unilateral Total Knee Arthroplasty During Stationary Cycling. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the introdu introduction. I want to also acknowledge my co-author for this study. And the total knee arthroplasty is a surgical treatment for people with end-stage knee osteoarthritis. Research on the total knee replacement patient has shown deficits of knee extension moment in the replaced limbs uh, during gait, as well as in cycling. Cycling is a common exercise used in the rehabilitation of the total knee replacement. It is important to understand the joint loading conditions of the replaced limb in cycling. However, it is still unknown if the knee contact forces uh, would show similar results as the knee extension moment as we see in the gait and cycling. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to use muscular skeletal modeling to examine interlimb differences of total tibial femoral, medial compartment, and the lateral compartment compressive forces for patients during stationary cycling. So we had you know, 15 uh, TKA patients in the study from a local hospital, local uh, orthopedic clinics. They cycle on a uh, stationary cycle ergometer in two randomized work rate conditions, 80 and 100 watts at a cadence of 80 RPM. During the final 10 seconds of data collection, 3D motion capture and the pedal reaction forces data were connected simultaneously. Okay, then we also use the a generic muscular schedule model with the modified knee joints um, in the open scene in the simulation. We use the static optimization to estimate muscle activation and forces and the joint reaction force analysis to estimate total knee contact force, medial and lateral compartment contact forces. For statistics, we ran two separate two by two repeated measures and no less. Here's the result for the limb by work rate uh, ANOVA, and uh, as you can see, we show no difference, uh, no significant difference in the uh, uh, interaction limb or work rate main effect for total compressive force, lateral compressive force, knee extensor and uh, flexor muscle forces. However, we did see a peak medial compartment force uh, as uh, in the interaction uh, in the main main effect, then the postdoc comparison showed that the post that peak medial compartment force was higher in the re long replacement compared to the replacement. 
Now here's the result for the compartment and the limb uh, Andover. Then the first one is uh, the figure one showed the at the 80 watt that interaction was found uh, for the peak medial compartment compressive force. Uh, so the then we did the post hoc comparisons and showed that the medial compartment force in the lung replacement was greater for the replace uh, for the replacement. And uh, in addition, we also find the medial compartment compressive force was greater than the lateral compartment force uh, for only for the non replacement. And we also did a you know, similar end over for the 100 watts, uh, which showed a lean main effect and the result post hoc comparison showed that medial compartment force was higher than lateral compartment force. So the lack of difference in total knee contact force between replace and non-replace limb is a surprising result for us. And it contradicts the results what we found in the peak knee extension moment in the same patient group in both the cycling and the gait. So potential reason for this lack of difference is that the magnitude of total knee contact force uh, in cycling is much lower than walking. So potentially that diminished the, our ability to detect the potential difference in the knee contact force between the replace and non replace limb. In addition, we did not monitor the C re uh, reaction force from the saddle or the seat and handlebars, which could also contribute to the lack of difference we found in the simulation. And uh, further studies are necessary to confirm those you know, findings. Uh, the take home message for this study is that uh, our results show that the you know, total knee contact force will, did not increase from 80 to 100 watts, which is a good news, you know, meaning that the patient in this you know, group of key care patients can cycle at a low work rate uh, for their rehabilitation and the exercise choices. So that include, concludes my study, uh, my talk, and thank you for your atten attention. Thank you for a great presentation, Song Ning. Uh, next presenter is Naoaki Ito. The presentation is walking speed is more strongly associated with knee rate of movement development in the unembarked than the inembarked uh, knee after an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Thank you for the introduction. Huh? Does everyone hear me fine? All right. Yes. So my name is Naoito. I'm from the University of Delaware. And like you introduced me, I'll be talking about game mechanics after ACL reconstruction surgery. So diminished knee loading after anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction is associated with post-traumatic knee osteoarthritis. And quadriceps dysfunction is a primary contributor to this phenomenon. Faster walking is associated with higher knee loads and altering gait speeds may be a feasible intervention to increase joint loading or improve gait symmetry. However, this association is not as strong in knees after ACLR, exaggerating gait asymmetries in faster walkers as seen by Garcia et al. in 2021 and Noble et al. in 2021. Quantifying the knee rate of moment development represented by the slope of the knee moment curve or what is happening leading up to these peaks during different portions of the weight acceptance phase of gait, and studying the association with gait speed may assist in understanding altered or asymmetrical peak moments. And this may explain the differential effect of gait speed observed in knees after ACL reconstruction. The purpose of our study was to establish the relationship between self-selected gait speeds and rate of moment development during the weight acceptance phase of gait and the involved and uninvolved knees of athletes six months after ACL reconstruction. We collected kinematic and kinetics during level walking from 69 participants approximately six months after ACL reconstruction in a motion capture setting. And knee moments were calculated via inverse dynamics. Here we have the uh, weight acceptance phase of gait graph. And on the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis is external knee flexion moment. The peak moment marked in red is what a large portion of our current evidence and altered gait mechanics after ACL reconstruction is based around. Our study looked at the slopes leading up to these peaks at three different time points, 
first of all, during the last 50 milliseconds prior to peak knee flexion moment. And here we have the 50 milliseconds prior to that, be between 50 and 100 milliseconds before peak knee flexion moment. And finally, the peak rate of moment development, which typically occurs immediately after initial contact. We ran simple linear regressions between each participant's self-selected gait speeds and the three rate of moment developments introduced in the slide. We'll start off by looking at our results during the last 50 milliseconds prior to peak knee flexure moment. Here on the x-axis, we have each participant's gait speed graphed against the rate of moment development, normalized to body weight and height on the y-axis. In red, we see a positive relationship in the uninvolved limb, demonstrating that gait speed explains approximately 29% of rate of moment development. However, in blue, now we have the involved limb, and we now see a much weaker association between gait speed and rate of moment development. You can see this through the spread of the data points, and in the involved limb, only 6% of the variability in rate of moment development was explained by gait speed. This next graph is for the peak rate of moment development, which is right after the initial contact. And a similar positive relationship was seen here with gait speed explaining roughly 17% of the rate of moment development in the uninvolved limb. This relationship was weaker than the 29% and we've seen in this lower, uh, the later stance phase of gait. In the involved limb, this relationship between gait speed and rate of moment development was even weaker. So faster walking, was associated with faster knee rate of moment development. And this was no surprise. However, the association between gait speed and rate of moment development was stronger in the uninvolved than the involved knee. And knee kinetics accompanying different gait speeds may differ between knees after ACL reconstruction. These associations are stronger closer to the peak knee flexion moment and weaker earlier in stance. This is indicating that even within the weight acceptance phase of gait, gait mechanics and different, different portions of the gait cycle may have to be considered to have a different, different relationship with gait speed, especially after ACL reconstruction. The rate of moment development metrics introduced in the study are parameters that are unique to specific intervals during the early phases of gait and may be helpful metrics to use when studying and implementing interventions addressing aberrant gait mechanics after ACL reconstruction. Thank you. Um, we have some questions in the chat. Um, first from Katerina uh, Radmanovic. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Lenz. I may have missed this, but how far out post-operatively was the TAR group, as in what was the time from post-op that the analysis was performed? Thanks, Katerina. Excellent question. It was 5.4 years on average, plus or minus 1.9 years, and our inclusion criteria was at least a year and a half post-op. Thank you. I was just curious. Absolutely. Um, Poon, do you want to ask your, your question? Yep, sure. So, uh, Dr. Chang, I have a question. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I think that a cycling motion has a large knee or hip flexion motion that may affect the geometric muscle path in the model. I'm wondering if the generic model has uh, any limitation for the large flexion motions. Yeah, thanks you know, for the questions. And uh, I agree that the range of motion is larger in the cycling than what you typically see in the in gait. And uh, so we, it's a good, very good question. We haven't really looked into that particular potential. Maybe the path might be uh, of those muscle tendon structure, maybe uh, having a different uh, deviation or greater deviation from what you normally see, and that could potentially affect you know, the muscle force and the activation patterns. So, Thank you. So what, one direction we probably, I think it, it's a good way to look at the potential lack of different sources of that lack of difference. So, so. Thank you. 
Do I have um, a question? I'm gonna, can I ask Andrew a question real quick? Mm -hmm. Andrew, that was a, a nice talk and it seems like you have now a, a way of identifying, you know, potentially early on uh, this the deformity. What kind of what kind of evidence or how would how would a clinician use this to make a, a treatment option for whether it be surgical or rehabilitation to help slow the progression or stop the progression of, of this deformity? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, clinically, um, there's a couple different techniques to help uh, correct flat foot deformity. Uh, there's uh, lateral column lengthening and uh, medial side, which is uh, where you lengthen the lateral column of the foot to help uh, rebuild the arch. And then there's also uh, another technique called a uh, medial displacement calcaneal offset, where uh, you move over, where you move the calcane the uh, heel medially to also help try and rebuild the arch. Uh, in order to return to that natural stance. Is that what you were asking or? Yeah, I just was curious how the how the clinicians would, would use the data because we can always, we can measure cool things in biomechanics and then figure out how to translate them into the clinic is always the most important part. Thanks. Um, I have a question for Naaki Ito. Um, do you expect that the differences between involved and uninvolved limbs would be greater during like jogging or running where there's a more rapid moment development in general or a more rapid moment development is required? Yeah, so just like our linear relationship shows that it seems that even if you're walking faster, that surgical need tends to not have too much of a effect on it from gait speed alone or increasing the movement velocity. Um, in this case, Yes, because at higher uh, walking speeds or in that case, gait speed, if you're running or jogging, you will most likely see an exaggerated uh, effect of that. I guess the easy analogy to think about is if you think about someone that has a minor ankle sprain and you see them walk, you don't see much of a difference, but you make them run and you see them start to limp. I think that's exactly kind of what this is capturing. Mm -hmm. So we can probably, if there's no other questions from the audience, we could probably head, head into the last block unless you had one that you wanted to ask. Nope, I was just gonna start moving on. So, okay, we're gonna start block three. So our first talk is from Clarissa Lavasser entitled Kinematic Changes Are Associated with Improved Outcomes Following Superior Capsular Reconstruction. Can everyone see the correct screen? Yes, I can see your title. Okay, screen. great, thank you. All right, here. All right, um, thank you for the introduction. I would like to begin by acknowledging the work of my co-authors. These are our disclosures. Rotator cuff tears are among the most common conditions affecting the shoulder. One viable treatment is superior capsular reconstruction. SCR is a newer surgery that utilizes a graft to stabilize the humeral head within the glenoid. SCR is often utilized for patients with minimal rotator cuff arthropathy. However, it is unknown how SCR affects the shoulder joint, especially during activities of daily living. The aims of the study were to determine the effects of SCR on scapular and humeral kinematics in vivo during a functional hand-to-head -hand motion, similar to what would be necessary for someone to comb their hair. Additionally, we wish to identify associations between the shoulder kinematics and patient reported outcomes. Our hypotheses were that the movement would occur by using more glenohumeral based motion and less scapular movement after SCR, and that these kinematic changes would correlate with patient reported outcomes. 10 patients with irreparable rotator cuff tears were enrolled in this IRB approved study. Patients were tested before and one year after SCR and the ASCS, DASH and work surveys were all collected at both time points. During testing, we imaged the affected shoulder during three trials of a hand-to-head motion. At each visit, synchronized biplane radiographs were collected at 50 images a second for two seconds. We then determined shoulder joint motion using a validated registration process that matched digitally reconstructed radiographs of the bones to the synchronized biplane radiographs. Finally, shoulder kinematics were calculated, specifically glenohumeral abduction, horizontal plane rotation, and internal external rotation 
Rotations of the scapula relative to the torso were also calculated by combining the scapular rotations from the biplane radiographs to the torso kinematics from conventional motion capture. All six scapular and glenohumeral rotations were normalized to percent motion, such that zero represents the hand lifting off the lap and 100 represents their hand reaching the back of their head. Trials were then averaged at corresponding percents of the movement, and the endpoints of all six rotations were found for both test dates. We then summed the absolute instantaneous changes in rotation angles across the motion and normalized each component to calculate the percent contribution of each rotation to the motion. Moving on to our results, the end range of each of the rotational components are plotted with pre-surgical end range across the X and post-surgical across the Y. Solid black lines are included to visualize no change from pre to post-surgery. Using paired T-tests, the glenohumeral internal external rotation end range was less post-surgery than it was before, but the scapular protraction was found to be greater after surgery than it was before. Looking at the contributions next, the pre and post average of the six rotational contributions are represented as the middle lines within the group variability boxes. There were no differences in the average contributions from pre to post in any of the rotational components as evaluated by paired t-tests. However, variability seen by decreased box sizes decreases for almost all rotations, and this was significant for both glenohumeral abduction and internal external rotation. Next, we evaluated the associations between those changes in the contribution with Pearson's correlations. Here, the change in the glenohumeral abduction contribution plotted across the X was positively correlated with the change in the glenohumeral internal external rotation plotted by the blue triangles. On the contrary, the change in the glenohumeral abduction contribution was negatively correlated with changes in scapular protraction such that a decrease in glenohumeral abduction contribution resulted in an increase in scapular protraction contribution and vice versa. When we look to see how these kinematic changes correlated with PROs, we can see that the changes in glenohumeral horizontal plane contribution were positively correlated with changes in ASCS scores using a Pearson's correlation. This suggests that a greater increase in glenohumeral horizontal plane contribution were coupled with a greater increase in ASCS scores following SCR. Contrary to our hypothesis, participants ended the motion in less glenohumeral rotation and more scapular protraction. Additionally, decreased contributions of glenohumeral abduction were offset by increases in scapular protraction and decreases in glenohumeral rotation. However, our second hypothesis was supported since an increase in glenohumeral horizontal plane motion was associated with improved ASCS scores. Additionally, we found that intersubject variations in glenohumeral abduction and internal external rotation were reduced following SCR, suggesting a convergence on a more similar motion pattern following surgery. However, without healthy controls, we are unable to determine if this movement strategy replicates healthy kinematics or an altered one. This work is clinically significant because it suggests that changes in scapular and glenohumeral kinematics following SCR suggest a convergence towards a more similar and potentially more efficient movement pattern. Additionally, surgeons may want to focus on restoring horizontal plane motion to lead to improved clinical outcomes following a rotator cuff tear. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Clarissa. We'll actually be hearing from her again for the next talk. Um, so this is presented by Clarissa Lavasser, and it's entitled Increased Abduction Range of Motion During Functional Activities is Associated with Improved Patient Reported Outcomes After Reverse Shoulder Arthroplasty. Thank you again, Sarah. Uh, Chris is not able to make it. He's a med student. And he's uh, back in clinic today, so I uh, have to present for him. Uh, we would like to thank our co-authors for the contributions to this work. And once again, these are our disclosures. Reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a common procedure used to restore functions in patients with rotator cuff arthropathy. While implant geometries and surgical techniques have been shown to affect functional outcomes such as strength and range of motion, little work has been done in vivo to explore these relationships. Additionally, few in vivo studies focus on functional activities of daily living after RSA or compare kinematics with patient reported outcomes. The aims of the study were to establish relationships between implant characteristics and in vivo shoulder kinematics after RSA, as well as to establish the relationship between in vivo kinematics and patient reported outcomes. We hypothesized that increased lateralization would increase the abduction range of motion and that larger abduction and internal external rotation range of motion would be positively correlated with better PROs. 
Patients who had previously received RSA from a single surgeon were enrolled in the study. Implant parameters, including retroversion, humeral neck shaft angle, glenoid lateralization, glenoid eccentricity, and glenoid size were all recorded from patient op reports. All patients were tested at least one year after surgery. DASH, ASCS, and constant Murley surveys were also completed at the time of testing. Subjects completed five shoulder motions, abduction, internal and external rotation at 90 degrees of abduction, a functional hand to head, a functional hand to back, and a circumduction motion. Each motion was repeated at least three times while positions of the reflective markers placed on the thorax and upper arm were captured using a 12 camera Vicon system. Humeral thoracic ab adduction, plane of elevation, and internal external rotation were all calculated using spherical coordinates. Additionally, a clinical internal rotation test consisting of the patient reaching up their back as high as, as possible was performed and the location of their hand was recorded. Scores on this test were separated into the four categories based on location as seen on the right. Associations between range of motion or functional levels and implant characteristics were all evaluated using separate multiple regression analyses. An ANOVA was used to identify differences in range of motion and peak rotations between the different levels of functioning subjects. And finally, Pearson's correlations were used to identify associations between range of motion and patient reported outcomes. 17 male and 15 female participants with an average age of 72 were tested around two years after surgery, and participants had a variety of implant characteristics as seen here. Ranges of motion for abduction, plane of elevation, and internal external rotation can be seen on this table for all five motions. We found similar ranges of abduction motion during the abduction, hand-to-head, and circumduction motions, all with about 90 degrees of abduction range of motion. The plane of elevation was highest in the hand-to-back hand motion and circumduction with about 92 and 103 degrees of motion on average. And finally, clinical internal external rotation range of motion was highest during that hand-to-back motion. We found significant associations between three implant parameters and range of motion. First, an increase in glenoid eccentricity was associated with decreased posterior plane of elevation during hand-to-back. Second, a decrease in humeral retroversion was associated with an increase in glenohumeral internal external rotation range of motion and an increase in plane of elevation range of motion. And third, a 145 neck shaft angle was associated with increased internal external rotation range of motion during both the hand to back and rotational movements, as well as increased plane of elevation during the hand to back and increased abduction during circumduction. Increased abduction range of motion during abduction, hand-to-head, and circumduction were all also found to be associated with better CMS scores. Additionally, increased plane of elevation and internal external rotation during circumduction were found to be better, were found to be correlated with better CMS scores. And finally, the highest functioning groups saw higher abduction range of motion during circumduction and internal external rotation range of motion during the hand-to-back motion than the lowest functioning groups. Additionally, the 145 neck shaft angle implants were associated with greater scores on the internal rotation test than the 135 implants. Our results suggest that less humeral retroversion, less eccentricity, and a 145 degree neck shaft angle correlated with greater range of motion during several motions, most especially during the functional motions. Unsurprisingly, higher abduction range of motion during functional movements also correlated with better PROs, specifically this constant Murley score. A strength of the study is the variety of motions analyzed in vivo to better characterize patient function and implant parameters. However, a limitation is the use of the skin motion, skin mounted motion capture for kinematic analyses. Future work will examine these relationships using biplanar radiography to further characterize the scapular motion that occurs during these motions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, moving on to the third talk in our session, this is presented by Anna Martinez. This is longitudinal changes in adjacent segment disc deformation after cervic cervical spine fusion. Sorry, I was muted there. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Anna Martinez. I'm an undergraduate uh, bioengineering student at the University of Pittsburgh. 
I would like to begin by acknowledging the contributions of my co-authors. We have nothing to disclose related to this presentation. Approximately 150,000 cervical fusion surgeries take place every year in the United States, with 25% of fusion patients requiring an additional surgery to treat adjacent segment disease, or ASD. In vitro studies suggest that ASD may be caused by excessive motion and disc loading to compensate for the immobility in the fused vertebrae. However, it is unclear if adjacent segment disc deformation increases after fusion or if other factors promote ASD. The aim of the study is to determine the change in adjacent segment disc deformation after cervical fusion. We hypothesized that disc compression, distraction, and shear deformation would increase from pre-surgery to three years post-surgery. Thus far, 20 out of 80 anterior fusion patients who provided informed written consent to participate in this ongoing IRB-approved study have completed pre-surgical, one-year post-surgical, and three years post-surgical testing. Patients initially sat upright with their head in a neutral position for one static image on each test day. They then performed three trials of full range of motion, flexion extension, and axial rotation, while synchronized biplane radiographs of the cervical spine were collected at 30 images per second for three seconds. CT scans of each patient's cervical spine were taken to create three-dimensional bone models. These bone models were matched with the bone images in the radiographs collected during testing using a validated model-based tracking technique to calculate vertebral motion. Five disc regions were identified based on end plate geometry, the anterior region, lateral, posterior lateral, posterior, and nucleus regions. Adjacent segment disc deformation is calculated based upon vertebral body end plate motion and is normalized to the static trial pre-surgery with a validated precision of 0.4 and 0.3 millimeters above and below the fused vertebrae, respectively. The compressive distraction strain and shear deformation were calculated for each instance during the vertebral movement using the equations on this slide. The maximum intervertebral disc compression, distraction, and shear deformation of the adjacent segments superior and inferior to the fused vertebrae were compared using a two-way repeated measures tested by disc region ANOVA test with a significant set at P is less than 0.05 and a post hoc, two keys multiple comparisons test. During flexion extension, the anterior region always underwent more compression and distraction than the lateral and nucleus regions, while the nucleus region underwent less compression than the posterior lateral region. Shear deformation was greater in the posterior, lateral, and posterior lateral regions than in the anterior and nucleus regions. There were no differences in peak compression, distraction, and shear deformation across test dates, nor were there any interactions between regions and test dates. During axial rotation, there were no differences in compression or distraction between regions or across test dates. Shear deformation was greater in the posterior lateral region than in the anterior and nucleus regions. The main findings in this study include significantly larger disc deformations in the posterior lateral region relative to the other disc regions during flexion extension and axial rotation. This is indicative of a potential mechanical etiology for the common symptomatic pathology in the posterior lateral region. There is no evidence to support the hypothesis that adjacent segment disc deformation increases from pre-surgery to three years post-surgery. This study failed to support the hypothesis that adjacent segment disc deformation increases after anterior cervical fusion. This is contrary to in, in vitro results. Longer follow-up may be needed to observe the effects of excess load if they exist after fusion. Alternatively, factors other than excessive load may drive adjacent segment degeneration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. Um, and so our last talk in this session is by Ram Hadas or um, I'm not sure if they are here. Uh, it's entitled Short and Long-Term uh, Effect of Surgical Intervention on Static and Dynamic Balance, Gait, and Pain Level. So if Ram or Jacob or Damon or Andrew or Isidore are here to present their talk, please make yourself known.
sounds like we get to have an extra long discussion. Yeah, so I guess let's just move into questions about the three previous talks we heard. Yeah, so there's a, a question in the chat from Krista for Clarissa. Um, very interesting talk, Clarissa. For the 10 individuals tested after the uh, SCR, was there was their rehabilitation similar in the one year after surgery? This may have played a larger role um, than the changes seen. Um, so the 10 subjects were all treated by the same surgeon who gave the same um, like PT notes, which I have right here. It was passive range of motion starting at six weeks, active range of motion starting at eight weeks and gentle strengthening exercises at 12. Um, we didn't actually, they all self-reported that they had completed their rehab protocol, um, but they were seen at multiple centers. So I don't, we don't have the exact information on whether or not they all received the same uh, PT. Thank you. Looks like uh, Dustin Crouch has a question. Let's see if that lets you play on. Yeah, it works. Uh, it looks like um, everybody from the last three talks was from the same group and it was very nice, uh, rigorous study designs and lots of data you get out of it. It's similar to, I guess, what uh, Dr. Roth asked earlier is kind of how does that inform the clinical decision making and do you have a process internally even for uh, feeding this information back, back to the surgeons who you work with there? Yeah, so and, I, yeah, so I'm, in, I'm involved person, yeah. in yeah. <laughs> uh, all three studies, um, but yeah, we uh, regularly meet with our surgeons. They kind of help to not only guide our research, but also um, we're kind of able to compare compare notes in a way. Um, so we obviously don't want to like immediately say that like this preliminary result is completely affecting this one thing, but you obviously want to have that interaction um, so that they can kind of guide their, their clinic in a certain way. So um, especially with like the SCR surgery, um, kind of looking at seeing going forward, looking at like a randomized clinical trial, comparing SCR to some other uh, rotator cuff repair surger surgeries to uh, really see that clinical difference so that uh, the surgeons have a, um, have a way to kind of translate that into clinic. Um, I have a question about, um, Clarissa, your second talk, the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, do you think arm dominance would affect your results? Like if the implant is in their dominant versus non-dominant arm? Um, yes, to a certain degree. So, um, we did have a couple people, this is a interesting little side tangent. We had a couple people who were, um, bilateral and, uh, the surgeon, um, intentionally chose to put certain parameters that he believed would help or make sure that they increase their abduction range of motion because the other one had a higher, like were able to score higher on their clinical internal exam um, because they had had reverse shoulder done a certain way on the other side. So they kind of, um, you know, there is something to be said about like you want to uh, kind of optimize the parameters that 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 participant needs. And I mean, speaking from my own experience, when I do that hand to back motion, I can get significantly higher up with my one arm versus the other. So absolutely. A question for, for Anna. Um, so if, if the, if the, the range of motion isn't the, you know, the driving factor in the adjacent segment, uh, degeneration that that's seen in, in these patients. You mentioned that there are some other factors. What do you think some of those some of those are? Some of those other factors could be patient specific. It could be age. There there could also be um, lifestyle decisions that the patients are making that could be affecting this um, their motion as well. So, okay. yeah. Thanks.
Uh, we have raised the hand from Krista Nelson. Yeah, hi. Um, great talks, really interesting. I'm a PT um, as well, so I see especially a lot of shoulder patients. So I had a question for the um, capsular repair and also the reverse shoulder. So um, patient factors, especially comorbidities such as diabetes can play a huge role in rehab and, and patient outcomes, um, especially with shoulder um, surgeries and shoulder injuries. So I was just curious for both of those, the first two studies, if anything was collected on medical history or you know, if, if there's any differences among those participants um, with respect to some of those patient factors. Mm -hmm. So for the first one, um, we definitely didn't analyze that with only 10 people, but going forward for the reverse shoulder, especially when we get into some of those biplanar radiography data, we, we plan to definitely include all of those different parameters in our analyses. Um, this was definitely just a preliminary with our motion capture, and then we want to look at it with our uh, biplanar radiography, but we like especially the glenosphere size, um, that's that's a hundred percent based on the size of the individual. Um, so that, and then like you said, it it plays a huge role in PT and therefore the clinical outcomes. Um, and so we we want to include stuff like that uh, in our further analyses. Okay, great. Are, are there any other any other questions from from the audience? We'll give it another few seconds here. And I want to remind everybody that if if there's a question that you want to ask, um, you know, maybe not in front of everyone, um, take advantage of the spatial chat that uh, Sophia just dropped into the chat. Um, this will be an opportunity for you know, some more one on one conversations with the speakers after this session. Um, it's the closest thing we can get to, to mingling in the virtual world. Well, I don't see any more questions coming through. So on behalf of Hoon and Sarah, I um, want to thank everyone for a great session. Thank all the speakers for staying on time um, and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Take care. <laughs>